Good morning. My name is Colonel Jason Rosestraw. I'll be your moderator for this morning. Our first speaker serves as the Commanding General of Training and Doctrine Command. He has served in a variety of command and staff assignments throughout his 35-year military career, most previous being the Deputy Chief of Staff G1 of the U.S. Army and the Commanding General of the Maneuver Center of Excellence. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to present General Gary Brito. Hey, good morning, Fort. Good morning, Fort Benning, and good morning, everybody. I got a, a small delay on this side, so I'll try and synchronize everything well. Uh, first of all, I guess I'm coming through okay, so I'll, I'll leave it at that and continue on. I know we, uh, because of connection issues, just a few minutes late, so I'm going to keep us on time today anyway. Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I've been the uh, trade out commander now for exactly and one hour will be exactly seven days, a full whopping seven days. And because of this pesky thing called COVID-19, I've had three of those days working from home. <laughs> so uh, things like that just happen. I guess we're all vulnerable, but feeling really good and we got a great team and uh, honored to be spending some time with you, although virtually, definitely would have loved to have been there in person, all, especially having spent some, a lot of time at Fort Benning. So regretfully, I'm here back at Attack CP Rear Eustace. Everything's going well. Hey team, I know I have a lot of representation there from the trade off staff and, and commanders there to include my, my battle buddy, Command Sergeant Major Hendricks as well. He's in the room today. And I know uh, they could help fill any information gaps that we have that I may leave out. And from what I understand, over the last two days, you received a lot on the, what I'll call the enemy, the enemy situation. And, and, and a lot of our strategic marching orders from the CSA, uh, Secretary and others, and the commanders that are on the ground. And from looking in the, the audience, all from the quick snapshot I had, all the seats are full. So today, I just simply want to talk a little bit about what TRADOC does and what TRADOC is for. Uh, from my seven-day perch in the command seat, and but also shaped a little bit by some time on the DA staff, well, two years on the DA staff, and also, as the, the moderator mentioned, uh, some time in one, one in TRADOC and, of course, at Fort Benning beforehand. And I know we have some great leadership and leaders doing some great things for our United States Army now. And just like you, I'm very honored to be part of that and put on the boots every single day. And yes, I do have on boots today, <laughs> even when I'm working at home. Now, I know firsthand, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and I know you do as well, the people, modernization, and readiness are our priorities for the Army. And our Secretary has laid out a very clear six, uh, six uh, prior, priorities also. And everything we do, as you well know, is focused on those priorities. And you have a large part of that. You and your position as a student, uh, cadre, commander, staff, everybody that's down there visiting today. So again, kind of open to my opening comments, what I'd like to focus on is a bit of what TRADOG does. And I had a mentor many, many years ago who said to focus on kind of what you are for as well, if you want to correlate that to task and purpose, not the, the media outlet, but our doctrinal terms of task and purpose. And I think you can kind of nest that more closely uh, to the understanding that we're trying to get to today as we talk about people, modernization, and priorities. Now, I'm very happy, uh, should I say, as a command, to be partnered very closely with AMC, Army Futures Command, Force Com, supporting all the ASCs and ACOMs. But a bit on trade off, and I know you know this now, and if you're sitting in the audience, you're part of it. Unless you came in the, Ar in the Army be and retired before 1973, everybody that has served or is serving has been touched by trade off in some form or fashion some form of fashion, whether basic training, some, some level of professional military education or something, you've been touched by trade out, and that's going to continue to be that way. Now, perhaps my words, and I'll offer them up as my words, trade out is very foundational to every single component of the United States Army and every single unit. And in preparing and uh, transitioning to this job, I had a couple non-commissioned officers and officers as well that made it very clear that I understood just that as we venture into uh, this position. 
And I would impart that upon you as students as well, uh, which I guess we have quite a few in the audience and the commanders and leaders of which you're gonna work with and continue to serve with as well. So with that team, I'd like to transition to the first slide, please. Uh, I don't see what you see, well, now I do. Uh, simply what Tradeoff does. Now, as I mentioned, unless you have been retired before 1973, you've been touched by aspects of all of this. I know every one of the graphics in the box boxes do not depict all of the Dotman PF, but a large part of our business as a trade-off organization, as an army organization is anchored on just that. And I would bring your attention to the upper left box as I look at it, maybe upper right for you, on the recruit, train, develop, and help guide and shape as part of our army team on where the army needs to go. And if I could simplify that just a tad bit, from the future soldier that wants to come in, shows the propensity to come in, and I know we will talk about that a little bit later on. And this afternoon, you'll have a, a, a I'm tracking a panel with some of our trade off team members, specifically uh, laser focus on the sessions that talk to that some more. Sir, we lost you on audio. Okay, I don't know. i tell you what I'm gonna do. I just came back on now, I don't know. I will go back to the very beginning. Not not the very beginning of the briefing, but on the slide and what TRADOC does just for, for sake of not knowing what I did miss. Uh, long and short of a team, I think I already talked about if you've been in for a while, unless you retire before 73, you've been touched by TRADOC. So we'll leave it at that. Uh, not knowing where I stopped, I go back to the upper gray box team on the recruit, train, develop, shape, and gu guide and shape. Now, not all the graphics talk to the actual Dotman PF that we're involved with, or the, the Army's involved with, should I say. And, and you all know that. But I do want to hit some of the highlights of what TRADOC does. And as we go through this, hopefully the context will connect to as well what TRADOC is for, which in my opinion is as equally, if not more important, uh, for the shaping of all of our United States, for the entire United States Army, all three components. Everywhere from that future soldier that is coming in the Army today, that has propensity to come in the Army today, more importantly, one of the challenges we're having is just that, the recruiting environment. I know you're gonna have an assessment panel later on with General Gervais, General, uh, General Davis and others to talk about those specifics. I believe Sergeant Major's on it as well. And they'll deep dive in some of that. If I have time today, I will also. So every way from the future soldier that joins and hopefully retains and stays in, all the way to the far end, our support with Army Futures Command and the Army staff on building the Army of 2030, which has started already, and looking at 2040 also, we'll continue to do that as well. You can clearly see how TRADOC must and will, in conjunction with your participation and leadership, uh, be nested with everything the United States Army is doing, and that's part of what we do now. It's not unknown that we have a large part of the doctrine, and I use my grunt terms, uh, if that connective tissue across all of the Dalton PF in any one shape or form has a gap in it or broken, we will have a problem, a challenge, in developing that Army of 2030, 2040, and beyond. And I know there are some in the room today that are involved with modernization very closely through the respective CDIGs, through the cross-functional teams, and you well understand that. And for those students that may not know that you're receiving levels of new doctrine and part of the people aspect of the modernization, you are indeed. And if you just simply look at a couple of train tracks, and again, this is my, my maybe my poor graphic analogy, but when any, in any one of those numbers, the D, O, T, L, and M, take off much faster than the other. The others have to stay, stay caught up with it or connected with it in order to make that delivery of the modernization holistically work well. And it, it may be a small example, a new piece of equipment that doesn't have the facilities or doesn't have the people identified far to the left, it's not gonna roll out as a complete modernization strategy. And many of us have, have seen that. Now for the students in the room that are waiting to go be platoon leaders, uh, squad leaders, first sergeants, or company commanders, or some may go serve on a, on a staff level somewhere. 
you may not be worried about that, and quite frankly, may not have to be worried about that. That's what the trade-off organization and leaders are for who will do that for you. But all of this is a system and a process and works very well when partnered, as I mentioned, with Forcecom, AFC, uh, Material Command, and others. So we will do just that. Now, uh, of course, a little bit of plug on the, on the organization itself. And I mentioned early on, every aspect of every soldier's life from a time to come into the Army, go through the MEPS, get your haircut, go through the graduations and training, whether from private to sergeant major, or lieutenant to general, you're going to be touched in some way, shape, or form from trade off, uh, whether it's through the 10 centers of excellence, uh, the 33 schools, the over 1,400 JRTC programs, and that's growing, and you name it, everybody in this audience in some way, shape, or form will be touched by the organization. And I do not bring it up in a bragging way in any way, shape, or form because it's only as effective and will be continue to be effective when partnering with Forcecom, AMC, AFCs in the Army at large, and of course, the support of the commanders represented in the room today. So that partnership is what makes it successful. Again, not seeing the exact slide you, you're looking at, but doctrine's key, uh, a, a very, very important role in working the organization as of the unit. Now, there is a lot of there is a level of complexity with that, working very, very closely with closely with the centers of excellence, of course, which are trade is trade-off, and the Army, Army Futures Command and our DA staff. But uh, it's, and I'll, I, I won't go too long because I wanted to say some time for Q&A at the very end. But uh, as, as mentioned, we need to have that connective tissue across all the Dalton PF as we develop our Army, train our Army, and quite frankly, build what we, we exist for today. Okay? Okay, team, what I would like to do now is move on to the third slide, and it should be titled, What Trade-Off is For? And I am going to spend a little bit of time on this one. And I uh, just kind of talk to you in my in my words, and I'll ask the phone a friend if my sergeant major or any of the other team or the staff in the room would like to assist. And uh, I won't mention the mentor by name, but a couple of years back, and this happened to be when I was serving in the trade off, said when developing any ideas. In this case, we were we were actually looking at Force 2025, uh, looking at some new FM rollouts and some other things. It's always so important, important to connect what you do to what you're for, and that what you're for was going to uh, greatly assist our United States Army. So I would like to take it in that context as we talk about it. Again, and in, uh, in truth in lending, I worked with the staff over a couple of days prior to prior to assuming command, and wanted to land on this message for the audience uh, today. Uh, not only those that are students. But for those that have been uh, committed leaders in our United States Army. So first I'll go, trade-off is for our soldiers. And I would offer up our soldiers from the new private up to the new general, all ranks in between. Uh, warrant officers, of course, included. Now, uh, I did not see the chief of staff's brief early in the week, but I can tell you that he is, and rightly so, a laser focus on combat readiness and everything to the left of that that built it. So the cohesiveness and dignity and respect that we need to build is all part of what is needed for the soldiers. Everything that works up to the, the great doctrine, the solidified training, the connection with the combat training centers, which I think some of the leaders are represented there today, all of which trade out has a piece of, whether it's the targetry, understanding the op four, uh, the doctrine and leadership that's involved in that, all of that, that builds a combat readiness for our army is critical. And for that reason, uh, all of the energy, the, the, the brain power, everything we need to do in the connection of the Dalton PF, as mentioned here in a few of those slides, is critical. Uh, on, on the top bullet of the slide is critical within the domain of, of trade off. You will note that I, I have in parentheses both military and civilian. Now I do realize as a large organization uh, from my previous life, uh, previous position that focuses on the civilian nature, the civilian uh, leadership in our army. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have 289,000 civilians that support our military army, civilian professionals. Uh, we would not succeed without that. 
in a lot of the training, professional military education, doctrine and regulations that we support as a TRADOC headquarters, a TRADOC organization, support that as well. So I would offer to you, TRADOC is for our soldiers from PFC to general and our civilian professionals as well. I'll move down to the second bullet and I'll speed it up just a tad bit. TRADOC is for our army and for the joint force. I'm not gonna sit up here and give the multi-domain operations uh, a briefing to you. Um, it's not relatively new, uh, maturing of course. Uh, many of you heard about or will and throughout your respective classes. But our army is a very viable, lethal portion of the joint force. So the doctrine we develop, the training we do, whether as, as you well know, we're starting at the individual collective level through the joint, uh, through the training centers respectively, uh, through the pro exercises like project convergence, through some of the uh, division and core level exercises, all feeds into a joint war fighting capability that is critical. And for that, I would offer to you that the support from TRADOC to make sure that our army is ready to support the joint force when called upon, and it will be and has been. You can just look back to last year of history and what's things that aren't going now. It's critical that we keep our, our, our sword sharp in ensuring trade up is for our army and all components of it, and of course, the joint force. And I, I would argue that the, the role of the, the, the command in integrating all these efforts is absolutely vital and critical. And, and most of the equipment and the people that will be our army of 2030 has already gone beyond the big idea phase. You know, some of those people and skill sets, and I would offer the skill sets more importantly, are being identified now. Uh, the new air defense systems, I'm just using that for illustration, that are being looked at for 2030 are being identified now. The formations that may be needed in 2030 are being identified now. And you can fast forward that in echelon, of course, uh, in for, the, for, the for the future years. And not to oversimplify it, but the system works that way. So the integration efforts that TRADOC has through the CEDAS, through the Centers of Excellence, working uh, with the fielding of the uh, of, uh, soldier touch points, which obviously involves FORSCOM, the modernization efforts through Army Futures Command, the material support logistically to sustain it, executed, planned, and resourced through AMC is all key at that connective tissue that I mentioned early on uh, across the Dalton PF to ensure we have the Army of 2030 we need, and we can execute and close those gaps in LISCO and MDO and fight in the, fight in the near term and in the future while not, re, not, not losing the capability of, of uh, warfighting capabilities we've had in the past and leveraging our legacy systems as well. And I, and I didn't see everybody in the audience, but I do know that the majority of you have already, have already lived that and you will be the ones leading in our future also, okay? Uh, skipping down to that, I believe the next one you have is TRADOC is for our nation. Now, this may sound like a little bit of bumper sticker, but um, our nation needs, and our history has shown, I'm not getting political here, team, our nation needs and our history has shown that we must have a great army. There hasn't been a 911 call yet that so much amount of the army has not taken off to do, whether it's platoon, the IRC, our ready division, I won't name anything, or some type of operation, and, and many in the room have done it and will, but our nation needs it. So trade-offs role in make, ensuring that our leaders are ready, we have the right leaders, our soldiers are lethally trained, 22-week uh, OSIS is a great example, all the high lethal training going on at Fort Benning is a great example, our support to the uh, joint exercises is a great example, support to the combat training that is a great example, and how that feeds up into the joint fight, a great example. So our nation needs all of that, and the professionalism, cohesive, dignity, respect, taking care of the soldiers and families, feeds into that as well. And this provides, in my terms again, that first layer of bricks, the foundation that force calm and joint elements need to be and feed the combatant commanders the types of formations they need to be lethal for our nation. And lastly, team, I think the last bullet you have this trade-off is for the American people. And I'm gonna take a little bit of risk and just use my terms on it and say why that's important. Now, we're taking ownership of this. 
we, when I say we, TRADOC, although this is an Army opportunity, I'm choosing that word on purpose. Now, later on today, and I think I'll get to a little bit this morning if I have time, I'm looking at the clock there. On, uh, we are having some assessments challenges, which will turn into an opportunities for a variety of reasons, which I may talk to all to later on. Uh, but the fact that it's 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 not only the department's job, it's the trade off job, it's the army's job to manage from inception when a person wants to come in all the way through soldier for life to take care of the soldiers that we have all the way through their time when they should get out before 20 years or even as veterans. It's important for the American people to maintain that positive contact with the community, to maintain that positive contact with the communicators. In my terms, and some may have heard this before, if we're in uniform, that handshake we have with mothers and fathers across America that have supported their soldiers, uh, sons and daughters that may have volunteered to join. And that's critical. And that should be taken seriously as you, if you think about it. So. Kind of recap and what are we for? We went through a little bit about we, what we do and the recruit, train, develop, guide and shape. Connect that to what we're for very quickly for our soldiers, the army as part of a lethal army as part of the joint force, trade ups for our nation and trade ups for the American people. And I could probably stop right there <laughs> in a little bit about trade off but I very much want to underscore the importance of what we as a collective team do partnered with the leaders that are represented in the room that represent Forces, Forces Command, Army Futures Command, Forces Command, Army Futures Command, Material Command, and what we do to support the combatant commanders and the ASCCs. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna shift focus just a tad bit onto modernization, having covered the somewhat at, at the 20,000 foot level, prioritization of people, want to shift a little bit to trade up support to modernization. And that should be on the next slide, and I think its title starts with understanding. Now, I would like to connect this team, and again, unfortunately, I wasn't in the room when you received the Intel update or spoke with the chief, I believe. But I would like to connect this to, which is uh, not old school doctor, just plain doctor, and understanding the enemy situation. I know you received a very good brief on that earlier this week, and some of the small groups are talking about it as well. And I'm only giving an example of using Russia, Ukraine, and our lessons learned on this situation. But I believe, in my, well, I would offer up, what that offers up to his team, and just looking at just this small little vignette of Russia, Ukraine, is the importance of continually ensuring we, as the United States Army, maintain an overmatch and a dominance. You don't, we don't want, you don't want, we don't need a fair fight. It's not about that. We want to be dominant in every, every aspect of the domain. I won't, I won't go into all the MDO and other aspects, but the dominance is necessary. And to have that, you can walk it back to kind of what I talked about earlier, what we do and what we're for. And that's trade-off's main piece and main contribution to maintaining this dominance for our United States Army in support of Jesus Command, AMC, Force Com, and others. I know you keep hearing that, but I want to ensure that this is a, uh, make it very clear, this is an Army fight and an Army battle. Now, I do have a small example on the slide I believe you're looking at that it's more than just M, uh, more than just a material issue. And I, I offer that up to, to underscore my point again, ladies and gentlemen, about the connection and the necessity between a balance and an up tempo, as mentioned in the middle there, on all the Dotland PF. So doctrine to support the next generation tank. Dotland, Dotland uh, I'm sorry, doctrine organization, the right people that'll support the next generation combat people. The whole bit again on training for the next generation IVAS or, or what, whatever we're gonna have out there through our modernization priorities for the Army. I think you get my point. So if I can wind that back just a tad bit, all that trade-off does supported by you and will be led by the great leaders in the room uh, once you're out of the student role is critical. So in progress IPR or AAR, what trade-off does, I laid it out, recruiting, training, developing, guiding, and shaping, 
and that's the, what it is for and all the aspects of it, the soldiers, civilians included, our army, the nation, American people. Narrow that down a little bit to our big support of uh, modernization. So we nested loosely the priorities of modernization, people in modernization, and all that, of course, feeds into maintaining readiness, combat readiness for our United States Army as a whole. Hey, for the moderator, uh, I definitely want to stop by 9.05 uh, to, to allow us to put some Q&A. So give me the hook if I'm not there already. I will not get to all the slides, but I believe the remainder of, uh, I'm going to get to a couple more, but the accessions was towards the end and the panel will be able to address that later on. So team, I want to pause for a moment and flip to the next slide, shift the subject a tad bit, uh, titled Dotland PF Integration. Now, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit to the diagrams there, but my big takeaway that I would like to offer up is the connective tissue uh, of all the Dotman PF. And I apologize for using that term too much, but I think it, you can understand it. And in truth and lending, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I was probably towards the senior part of, of being an officer when really started to resonate on the importance of uh, synchronizing and connecting all of that is involved with uh, modernization in, in the Dotman PF. Now, I do title, uh, I do highlight the Army of 2030 because there's a large focus on that right now. And not too long after that, there'll be just as much of a focus on 2040 and beyond. It is necessary to look at it in that respect, whether it's budgeting, uh, whether it's uh, uh, industry time, whether it's the time involved in research and development, all that needs to be part of the mix, which kind of highlights uh, the necessity for the integration early on. But I have just a couple of examples uh, that you may see, just, just to highlight a few uh, that we're involved with. And I won't pick any one thing, uh, like any one piece of equipment, but you can see some of the examples across the bottom, how we've evolved over time from what was nece necessary a couple of decades back on old, old, older inland battle doctrine to capstone doctrine a couple of decades later the MDO doctrine that is out there now, and a few examples of building to the left or the right, any way you want to look at it, and supporting, uh, as I mentioned early on, some of the ongoing things that will make the Army 2030 very effective. So enabling a lot of the theater commands, uh, things related to Pacific Pathways is a great example. Other exercises across many other theaters is a great example. A few years back, and, and I had the luxury of actually evolved and previously This meeting is being okay, recorded. Connect a little bit back on developing training for and executing training for the very first SFAB. And now we have several. A lot of weird things going on in the screen, but I'll keep on talking. Now we have several doing great missions. And I'll speed it up a bit because my, my time clock is moving here. But long and short of it, team, you can see examples across all these components of Dotland PF that our Army is executing now. Students in the room, you are an example of where our Army is working for Project Athena, connecting leadership development, education, and professional growth from young officers all the way up through senior officers as well. Now, team, I will mention there's a distinct connection, deliberate connection with what the field does, what the commands do, what the uh, headquarters department of the Army staff does as well. Okay, team, uh, because I see some movements on the screen, I'm gonna take just three more minutes. I'll go to the next slide. And I think that may be a good stop point for me to take some questions and answers. But also team, I wanna use this type slide as a stage setter. And I'm taking some risk here on the accessions panel that you may have later on. And I bring this up for one big, one main reason, uh, our army, needs soldiers. Our army needs to be strong, lethal, well-trained, and well-led. My terms, I'm not giving you a bumper sticker. Now, we are having some assessment challenges at the moment. Uh, the return to talk, they are becoming an opportunity. We will tackle this and we will beat it. We is the we, uh, you're included. So my ask of you, and I'll close here, team, 
and you, and you can read the bullets on the slide, uh, operationalize us a bit. You know, we have a domestic environment uh, that we will work to better understand, and we are and have to bring in the high quality soldiers that are in our army needs to fight and win our nation's wars. You can connect it right back to what trade off does, what trade off is for, in support of the army. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it that simple. So, I'll ask of you when you have an opportunity, whether individually, collectively, collectively, to showcase what our army does and how great it is, do such. If you have a relative, friend, brother, sister, cousin in high school now that has a propensity to serve and wants to, talk to him or her, help them serve, and we will get that done. Uh, but we need to bring in the privates to join our United States Army that'll build those lethal platoons, brigade combat teams, and, and such, become part of that great army we have, supporting the joint force, and just make it right the way that it needs to be. And you can take that final statement and connect it very back to the beginning of what TRADOG does, recruit, train, develop, shape, and guide to what TRADOG is for, our soldiers and the Army Joint Force, nation and American people. I talked to, to some of the Dotman PF, our big support of people, modernization, our Ephesian combat readiness. I know you heard that from the chief. And almost the state shitter a bit, again, taking risks, not knowing what the panel is going to talk about on the assessment panel you received later on this afternoon. So with that team, I'm going to stop here. Again, I apologize for not being in person. I really wish I could, but doing the right thing and the safe thing. And I know you're in great hands by the leadership of Fort Benning and uh, those in the room today. And I'll pause and be happy to take any Q&A if we should have any. And have a safe day. Thank you so much. <laughs>
but uh, showcase our army how great it is. Tell our story. We need everybody's help there. We will not waver on quality. That much I can tell you. And our piece of it is to ensure once a future soldier come in, comes in, they're trained lethal, good character, good reputation, and part of a cohesive team. Thanks. Thank you, sir. For the next question, as the Army focuses resources on modernization, what impacts do you anticipate to trade off, and how do we mitigate? Yes. Well, uh, re managing resources is a, is, a, is a balancing game of some respect. Now, I, I will tell you, and, I, and I'll, I'll share, and I actually feel very privileged for this, having just come from the Army staff and seeing how that process works, uh, for one, we need to uh, ensure that our equities are well understood when those very tough decisions are made by senior leaders on where resources are going to go. And you're probably talking, and as rightly so, on money. That's a big, big level issue. Uh, so having served some time on the staff and a level below that at Fort, Fort, Fort Benning is to ensure that our equities and responsibilities are well articulated and they have to be and, and, and shared and, and well understood on how they fit into the modernization of the Army as well. So uh, we, we've done that, we'll continue to do that and I've seen how these hard decisions are made. Now, truth in lending, Every organization will feel some level, may feel some level of a discomfort when, it, when, when priorities are shifted or resources have to be focused in a different area. Now, it could impact, in our case, uh, civilian strength. It could impact military strength. It could impact money we need now, money we want now for XX building that gets rotated later on. So very much a balancing game, but uh, I would tell you it's good old school sleeves up staff work to ensure that equities are well understood, priorities are well understood, and when you're ready to execute, the requirements are laid out clearly with respect to modernization. And not to give a foot stomp, but I will in this case, that kind of highlights my point of the connective tissue behind Dotland PF. All aspects of the Dotland PF that TRADOC may have responsibility for may need to be well understood when it comes to any modernization program, or you may not get the resources that you need. Now I'll leave it at that. Thank you, sir. For the next question, there are examples that innovation, including drones, mobile protected firepower, and the optionally manned combat vehicle requires organizational overhaul. Do you foresee a change to the standard IASBCT structure? I foresee a necessity to look at changes. Now, I'm going to say that with a little bit of risk. It is not solely done by trader. It is done in conjunction with Futures Command. It is in done in conjunction with Headquarters DAG3. And I know everybody in the audience knows this, but obviously we will leverage fully the capabilities that any modernization of future technology will give us in order to minimize risk, minimize putting soldiers in harm that they don't need to be, and leverage the technology that any modernization program that will give us, although it does not replace the people. Now, specifically to your question, uh, of course, and yes, and we've done this over many decades and will continue in the future to look at, to analyze structure to see that is best nested with and leverage the capabilities that any modernization uh, delivery will give. And to your example, I'll, I'll give a different example. Yes, we have uh, UAVs and other things, but we also have some robots that have been very effective. So if we don't have to put a soldier out there and a robot can do it, yes, you can look at, analyze the structure of those three types of brigades that you mentioned, but assure that they're still lethal. And there may be some changes. Heck, in my time alone, Matter of fact, there were two just in battalion command. So two, two organizational changes while I was in command that I witnessed to leverage what modernization was going, did deliver. So it's smart to do so, but not only for the sake of savings, but for the sake of continuing to be lethal and fully leveraging what that technology is going to give you. It wouldn't be smart to do any, anything otherwise. 
you know, a gun that can sh shoot farther and faster, you can work the organization around that to continue to make us better. I am going to reinforce one point, though. When, when designing what that organization may be, you must and you should and we will ensure that all the other Dartmouth aspects are tied to it, the leader training, the leader development, or the basic training they're going to get, the stuff you're going to get in Project Athena, all that must be nested or will not be as effective as it should be. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. For the next question, has TRADOC directed any changes to PLI or given new guidance based on the lessons learned from the conflict in Ukraine? Over. Uh, I'm not sure yet, but here's, and I'll give that caveat. I'm going to safely say no, but they are being worked on. Now, what I do know for sure. Uh, matter of fact, we had an observation team, and I'll be reading shortly on, on the secure net of some of the lessons that have been brought back from Ukraine and some of the associated conflicts hot off the press. And all that has been shared with well, our, our call team and others. Now, that, those observations will be shared with our senior leaders very soon, probably today, actually, because it's a, a task I have. It will be rolled into doctrine. It will be rolled into PME. Not to change doctrine at large, but to make sure we maintain the dominance, as I mentioned up front, that we need to, to work on. So specifically have, we called, hey, Benning, you're gonna change the following POI. These lessons will lead into that. But keep in mind, you know, this is the dominance we need in this theater against this army that we know of, and to be nested with what we also see as the operational environment 2030, 20, uh, 2040 and beyond, over. Thank you, sir. The next question. So, the question from a MCCC student is that in his former Force Com unit, there is a, a perception that a lot of the NCOs are being pulled to fill trade doc positions from Force Com. How do we ensure we have a balance between the right leaders in trade doc and Force Com? Over. No, that's a good question, and I tell you, I feel fortunate coming just having left the G1 to help answer that one. And, and for the student, from your perspective, I probably would have thought the same thing as a captain, but I will tell you that it's not true. I want to explain it a tad bit, and I apologize for laboring on this one. Uh, it is a balance for our Army and where the priorities need to be met. And all, it's just, just, I'll just pick a squad leader's example. As squad leaders, as big of a priority as is a drill sergeant and a recruiter. Now, the, 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 the work will be that the normal life cycle of professional assignments for non-commissioned officers and officers will fill those requirements when the requirements are well known. Now, truth in lending, and all of the Army saw this, we did have a bit of a surge a few months back where we had to have recruiters that had some experience, previous experience was successful, go focus on recruiting type issues for a short time. That did happen. But to your point, it's as important that the generating force requirements for non-commissioned officers, qualified platform instructors is a good example. Drill sergeant recruiters are filled along with a team leaders and squad leaders. So it is balanced as closely as we can. And the communications between TRADOC, FORCECOM, HRC, the G1s around the world will help manage this and also feeds into the, to the rearm process, which the G3 probably talked about earlier this week. I think he spent some time with you. Now, for the captain of the career course, uh, you should, and I'm really glad to see that you, you are concerned with that, but the bigger army is equally, if not and more, important, more concerned with that to ensure the proper balance is there so we do not lose that combat readiness we need. But if you look at it this way, if you don't have this qualified leaders as well to build that first layer of bricks, you're also going to have a problem. So it's a consistent balance game. The communications between each other, between the commands helps to get to that. And then you have those things that happen where you have to send this unit over here and they need to be filled to a certain percentage. Uh, family issues, stability, EFMP, um, uh, and spouse employment, professional military education, retirement, all that kind of feeds into that gonculator 
that goes into human resource management, which you shouldn't be aware of at the captain's career level, but all that feeds into it as well. I gave you a long answer, but not quite true that with taking from one organization to fill the other, it's a balanced game that has worked closely and will continue uh, to be more fine-tuned. Thanks. Thank you, sir. We have time for one last question, and I will leave time if you have any closing comments for us. So the last question, how is doctrine going to evolve to address the UAS threat? Are we looking at having a react UAS battle drill? Over. That's a good one. I will tell you, for one, uh, understand the UAS threat, which moves very quickly uh, because it's, it's, it's a quick technology. The technology gets better. And sometimes, it, for, especially for our adversaries, uh, that capability is, is cheap to make. Doesn't doesn't cost a lot. So we need to stay ahead of it as the best we can. There'll be aspects, and I'll just throw it out there. There's some aspects of uh, doctrine that need to catch up and will to ensure that we get the proper UAS doctrine out there. I didn't quite catch the last part of your of your topic of your question, but tied to the doctrine, I think it was on battle drills. Uh, certainly, uh, whether it's through a center of excellence or a combat training center or others. We will and always have developed battle drills, SOPs, and, and, and other templates to help us train better, to meet the doctrine, to maintain that dominance that we must have. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, over to you for any closing comments. Hey team, uh, thank you very much. And, and I, as I mentioned up front, I wish I could be there in person, but great engagement. Um, I'm 100% positive and confident. A lot of energy, motivation, and inspiration in the room. And keep it going that way. If, if nothing else, please walk away with what the trade off organization does, as I talked about recruit, train, develop, guide, and shape, and support of people, and modernization. What we're for soldiers, American people, Nation Our Army. As I mentioned, and others on the slide as well, that connects the dots between the mod the priorities of people, modernization, support to combat readiness for If you're a student in the room, study hard, learn hard, understand the doctrine that they're giving you, and train hard. Because you are you will be us one day. <laughs> you will be they. And pay attention to this. And I know you are. Well, the other leaders and combat leaders, battle buddies, peers, my, my sergeant major and others in the room. We all know the role that we have as a relevant and important organization on that first layer of bricks for the United States Army. So have a great, safe day, team. I'm looking forward to working with you in the future. And thank you so much for the time and for the assessions panel this afternoon. I know it's going to go great. And for the audience to ask some hard questions, it's important to get you a full support to help our chief and our secretary. Thanks for your time. Army Strong, victory starts here.